so far in battlefield Where I'll finally find your will Oh, then that's where I long to be In a desert without a drink On some old ship about to sing Lord, I'll go if you'll just be Psalms 23 verses 1 says the Lord is. Somebody look at your neighbor and say he still is. The Lord is. Boy, I could stop and preach uh, a five-night revival just off of that. The Lord is. My shepherd, I shall not want. One of the girl in Sunday school one time, teacher said, I want you to recite Psalms 23 and 1 that we learned from last week. She said, I know it, teacher. And she stood up and she was the first one. She said, Psalms 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. He's all I want. <laughs> I had to work too, won't I? Whew, hallelujah. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, a shepherd is the one leading. Somebody say, we're the sheep. We're the sheep of his pastor. That's what Psalms 100, verses 3 calls us. Look at somebody beside you and say, can you speak sheep? Look at them and say, bye, bye. Some tonight have went bye, bye, bye. Hallelujah. But, but sheep. So a shepherd leads sheep. Somebody say, shepherds don't follow sheep. Or they walk in mess. In 2011, when I was over in East Africa for two weeks preaching, we'd, we'd travel from, you know, places in big cities, you know, and then go out in rural areas. And, and the drive was long, but it was beautiful. I mean, you saw exotic animals you saw all kind of animals you wouldn't see here amen I'm, I'm serious giraffes zebras uh baboons i mean you 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 name it praise god you'd see them but everywhere you went you'd see mule and sheep in town out of town amen and you'd see herds of sheep out in the valleys man it's like he was in the land of israel i mean the land similar when you get out you know in those rural areas in those valleys in those mountains so beautiful and uh and and you'd see shepherds out there with their big stabs in their hands and their staves they, and and they would live with the sheep and you'd see them walking with big herds and you'd see a couple of their watchdogs that was the mules amen with them because as long as you had a couple of mules you didn't have to worry about no wolves or anything else and people still use the mule for that same reason today a lot of times not just a beast of burden but they they keep all the bad animals because sheep you know are prey to most everything amen and so uh they had to have a shepherd and the shepherd would lead them from one pasture that's why pastor sounds like pasture pastor is just a word that means sheep herder somebody say sheep herders yeah i'm a sheep herder that's why you always hear me calling to the sheep to get back to the pasture because how can you feed the sheep if they don't come to the pasture? They don't herd together. Some can't herd. That's why they can't herd. They don't herd me. <laughs> they, don't, they ain't herd. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And so, amen. So a shepherd leads sheep. And he said they shall not want. Why? Because they're following the shepherd. Somebody say, if you don't follow the shepherd, if you don't follow his lead, hallelujah, you will want. Want literally just means they're not going to be fed. Somebody say, if you don't follow the shepherd, you're not going to be fed. There's a lot of people today. There's a lot of shepherdless sheep. Roaming the hills of religion. 
just roaming around eating any old little thing that comes by. And no wonder they're malnourished. Come on, somebody. They've left the flock. They've left the fold. Somebody say, all oh, God's sheep needs a shepherd. Now, he's the good shepherd. Amen. John 10, 11 says he laid down his life for the sheep. Amen. Hallelujah. But he has given others, amen, to shepherd his flock, his fold. We call them pastors. Hallelujah. So we see here the chief pastor, so to speak, saying he's the Lord. Amen. And David is acknowledging he's my shepherd. I shall not want. David begins Psalms 23 saying, I'm following him. I don't know what all the other sheep's going to do, but I'm following the shepherd. Somebody say that's what the sheep's main responsibility is, to follow the shepherd. Those sheep out there grazing, it don't matter how pretty the pasture is where they're at. When the shepherd, amen, starts walking to the next one, starts moving, they follow him. And those that don't follow usually get caught by the wolves. Anybody hear Holy Ghost? Now the shepherd carries a, a staff, and y'all have heard me speak about this before, and the staff is for those, you know, wild beasts or those wolves or anything else he needs to fight off. Hey Amen. He don't, he don't beat the sheep with the, with the staff. Now, he'll kind of poke them in the rear end every now and then. See, or kind of just get out there a little bit and nudge. Go back, back, back. Yeah, he kind of nudges them. You know, you need, you need to come back over here. You're, you're going too far that way. Amen. But he never beats, beats amen, the bleating. <laughs> he's, he's not beating the bleating. Amen. Praise the Lord God. And so, and, 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 and a lot of times, those shepherd staves, amen, but also... Uh, look like this as well. They had a, a, a little hook on the end of them. Come on, somebody. Hey, Amen. Don't worry, sheep. I'm not going to come out here and grab you by the neck. Sometimes he'd use that to put up under their leg to kind of pull them, you know, you're going the wrong way. Hey, Amen. Somebody say that's what shepherds do. Hey, Amen. They're, they're supposed to pull on you. That's why we preach from a pulpit. Somebody say this ain't pulled pork, but this is pulled sheep. <laughs> gotta, gotta get you straight there a little bit and get a little crook there. Yeah. Amen. And so we just come, uh, snatch on the sheep's leg a little bit, get a little. Uh, hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And so somebody say the Lord is. That's how he works. Amen. And if you'll listen to him and follow him, somebody say he'll keep you from being devoured by the wolf. Because everybody say sheep are prey to the wolf. If you don't think there's a wolf loose, you're already deceived. If the sheep really believed there was still a wolf after them, they wouldn't skip so much of the pasture that they do. Amen. Praise the Lord God and lay out of the field and the foe where God wants them to be. And so he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Listen, listen to what happens when I follow him. This is part of the not want. He said in verses two, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. So what he's doing, he's leading me. He's guiding me to where, you know, the pasture is green and flourishing and producing. Come on, somebody. In other words, he's, the shepherd's responsibility is to give you good food. I had a preacher, a pastor, and I've been doing this almost 32 years, and, and almost 28 years of that was nothing but just traveling from one state and one city and one place, one country to another. Amen. And preaching. We still travel. You know, some we did in the last few months. Went to Wisconsin and some different other places. Even went to Kentucky this year. Amen. As far as long distances and, and, uh, and, and preach the Word of God. But, you know, uh, I've... I've, I've, I've watched people think, you know, I can do this without, you know, the green pasture. And, and some ought to say only the shepherd can lead you there. And, and I had a pastor one time. He, he told me, he said, man, he said, I'm a good pastor. He said, but I hate preaching. I thought, man, you a deacon. I was a whole lot younger then. I'd probably tell somebody if they said that to me now, the older I am. Amen. But I was thinking, you're a deacon. And a deacon's supposed to be able to preach or teach when they have to, but they don't do it all the time. 
Amen. A pastor does it all the time. I thought, Lord God, the whole role of a pastor, you know, and in modern Christendom, everybody makes the pastor out as, as you know, uh, I kind of feel like sometimes they think the pastor is like what, you know, when Mary saw Jesus at the tomb when he was raised from the dead, she was weeping, so her eyes was all glassy and, you know, just, you know, filled up with tears, so she was a little blurred in her vision. She saw Jesus and thought he was the gardener. Ain't that just like everybody? They think Jesus is everything that he's not. They want him to be something he's not there for. And a lot of times people see ministers as everything but what they're supposed to be doing. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? And, 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 and so, you know, everybody say the responsibility of the shepherd is to feed the sheep. But the sheep's got to be willing to show up for feeding time. Amen. And to be in leading time to go to the next pasture. So that is our role is to bring you to green pastures. Oh, glory to God, to give you the word of God, to give you that that's fresh. Green's the color of that that's fresh. Psalms 92 and 10 said, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. And so he said, the Lord's my shepherd. And when I let him do the leading and I follow him, he brings me to green pastures. And somebody say, it's the green pastures. It's the good eating. The word that he get, amen, that I feed off of. Somebody say, that leads me to still waters. That leads me to a place where it's calm. Oh, glory to God. A place, not of ease, but a place of peace. Hallelujah. Amen. And he said, he restoreth my soul. The soul's the seat of my emotions. It's my mind. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So the Lord is my shepherd. So we see that in the first three scriptures there. He's leading me. So that's what shepherds do. They lead the sheep. Hallelujah. And listen right here. He also leads them not just in the green pastures. Amen. And where there's still waters where it's all looking pretty good at this point. But verses 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So the same shepherd that led him through the green pastures, that led him to where the still waters were, that led him in paths of righteousness, that restored his soul and his soul restoration of things lost, is also the same shepherd that'll lead him through valleys, lead him through dark places, where the shadow of death is but somebody shout David said you're with me meaning the one that led me through the good times my shepherd is the same one that'll lead me into tough times in the dark times and through the hard places through the valleys of the shadow of death somebody say death has no shadow except life and its light is there present. That's why he said, thou art with me. Somebody say, a shadow can't exist without the light. Oh, God's with me. God is the light. First John 1, 5. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So God's with me. Somebody look at your neighbor. Let's just pause right here and praise him. Look at somebody and say, it may be dark, but he's still there. Tell him, say, you may not can see him, but he can see you. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, you may not know where he's at, but he knows where you are. He's there. He's there. Ain't you glad the darkness and the light are alike to him? Psalms 139 verses 12. Yea, though I walk through. Not yea, though I fall down and die in. Walk through. A lot of times we don't like to walk through. We want to run through. We want to run out. We want to take a jet airplane through it. Amen. Walk through. Somebody ought to say, that's the way out. Walk through. And there's a misconception, it's a deception. Now, however we live, where people, false teachers have taught the sheep, the church, that the perfect will of God means perfect everything. That everything's just always supposed to be just right, all right. And if it's not, ah, like Job's friends, you must have done something wrong. Hello. Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost in Luke 4, 1, and was led by the Holy Ghost he was full of into the wilderness, not to enjoy a sabbatical in the shade. Come on, somebody. But to be tempted of the devil. And 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and prayed. And then when he come out of the wilderness after it was over, verse 14 of Luke 4, he returned into Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And the first thing he did was go into the temple, somebody say into the church, and cast devils out. 
Then he starts healing and raising the dead and doing all other kind of things. But somebody say he weren't ready. He weren't prepared, not even the son of God, though he was Holy Ghost filled and Holy Ghost led until he was led through a wilderness, until he walked through a wilderness. Then he was prepared to be used by God. Somebody say when God wants to prepare you to be used by him, he's not going to carry you into a worship service. He's going to carry you into a wilderness of separation. He's going to take you into a place where you feel isolated, where you feel all alone, where you feel trapped, and there's no way out. But if you can walk with him there, God said, I'll let you walk with me anywhere. Mm -hmm. Somebody say, a valley comes just before God uses you. All right? And he said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so the rod and the staff we just showed you earlier is what he leads the sheep with. He's tending the sheep. Amen? So that means the shepherd's still there. If the rod and the staff's there, the shepherd is. Somebody say, you may not see him in the dark, but feel his nudge. Feel the rod, the staff. Hallelujah. Somebody say, stay with the shepherd. Oh, if you don't hear nothing else tonight, look at somebody beside you say, stay with the shepherd. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because he's leading you somewhere. Somebody say the whole time he's leading us somewhere. We think the shepherd's just supposed to lead us in green pastures and just lead us beside still waters and lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Oh, everything's just wonderful. No, the same one that leads us there will also lead us into these valleys. Lead us into places. Ain't it amazing? David said, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want, but he never said thou art with me until he was in the valley. Mm, there's the presence of God. Amen. In verses four. Now he acknowledged, you know, the Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want. He's following him. But they got closer in the valley. That's when he said, thou art with me. Huh. In verses one through three, when it was all good, you know, he was saying, I'm following you. I'm behind you. I'm following you, great shepherd. I'm following you, Lord. But then in the valley, he said, thou art with me. That's a statement that means I've come up alongside of you. I'm not just following you now. I'm, I'm walking beside you. Exodus 33, 21, God told Moses, he said, I'm going to set your feet on a rock and there's a place by me. And I'm going to set your feet on a rock. Someone say a place by me. Somebody say he got intimate. He got closer in the valley. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. And, 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 let's, and listen what happens next. He said, thou. And you see it up on the screen. Thou. Somebody say, there he is. Who? God. Don't forget this in, in Psalms 23, verse 5. Thou. That's the same thou art with me in verses 4. Thou. Somebody say, thou art with me in a valley called the shadow of death. But somebody say, in that valley, there's a prepared table. When God wants to set a table, when God wants to, the word table there literally means a table that is spread. Anybody understand what a table that is spread means? It means a table that has all kind of things on it. It's not an empty table. It's not just a table top with nothing sitting on it. He said, but thou preparest a table. Somebody say before me. Somebody say ahead of this affliction. Somebody say beyond this battle. Mm -hmm. Amen. Before me. Somebody say there's my future. Look at somebody beside you and say, when God wants to show you your future, he takes you in the valleys. He makes you think it's almost over right before he shows you what's to come. Yeah. Oh, glory to God. He said, thou prepares a table before me. Somebody say, in the presence of my enemies. Thou, there it is again. The same thou art with me in verses four. Verse five, he is saying, thou anointest my head with oil and my cup runneth over. So there's a whole lot more of thou than there are presence of enemies. Somebody say, you never face the presence of enemies alone if the Lord's your shepherd. The one that leads you beside still waters, leads you in the green pastures, restores your soul, leads you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, but also likewise leads you into the valley of the shadow of death just for you to realize I'm with you. And then right there in the middle of the lowest place in your life, God says, look at the table. I got prepared. Now, the word preparest, 
Preparest literally means to set the table in array for battle. Now, what did you think about when you first heard table? You probably thought about what you just said at not long ago, probably a week ago, you know, today. Thanksgiving table. Turkey spread and dressing spread and then our midsection spread. Hallelujah. Some of us is still experiencing the spread. Hallelujah. <laughs> Brother Rob said amen. Amen. Uh, so, uh, but that ain't the table. The first definition of the word prepare us a table, literally right there in Hebrew, means to set in array a table of battle. This is where, amen, glory to God, the captains of the army come. And they sit down together and they get their battle plan. Somebody say, so the table in Psalms 23, 5 is not just an eating table. It's not just a table of blessing. It's a table of battle. Amen. God says there's going to come a battle when I'm getting ready to do something through you like I've never done. God says it's before you. Somebody shout in front of me. There's something ahead. God's preparing me for a future. But somebody shout, it will not come without a battle the table and listen what this word table also means in, in the, the preparest the table it means to set things in row it means to arrange them and put them in order somebody say it means the king's table somebody say a private table so we ain't even got to the food yet the cup's gonna come in just a moment first definition of prepares a table in Hebrew, it's a table of battle. It's a place where battle plans are made. Where men and women of God prepare for war. Everybody say Christianity is a warfare. Now Christianity is a welfare because that's what most folks think Christianity is. They just look for a handout. Come on somebody. But real Christianity, come on somebody, is a warfare. My Bible didn't just tell me follow him. My Bible tells me in 2 Timothy 2 verses 3, listen to this. He said, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible said in 2 Timothy, amen, glory to God, chapter 1, I believe it is in 12. He said, fire, chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Ecclesiastes 3 says there's a time of war and a time of peace. Amen. First Timothy chapter one, verses 18 says that Paul told Timothy, he said, the prophecies that were spoken before over you is so you might war a good warfare. When God tells you something about your future, it's for the fight. God don't give you prophetic utterances and tell you something about your tomorrow today so you can just shout and sing hallelujah. He tells it to you in advance so you'll have something to fight with when the battle comes. Because anything God says it's going to happen, if it's sent from God, it's going to be fought against. It's going to be attacked. The enemy is going to try to come and stop it. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? So when God says, thus saith the Lord, this is what I'm going to do in your life somebody say go ahead and shout but don't forget to get your faith up and get ready for a fight you better sit down at the table and make battle plans because it ain't coming without a fight all right the table also means the king's table it literally in hebrew means a private table so this ain't a public table this is a private table in john 12 verses 3 this is after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had been in the tomb four days, stinking, decaying. Jesus calls him out of the grave and tells him, take his grave clothes off. And the boy's alive. What a miracle. And in John 12 and 3, it says, Jesus and Lazarus are sitting at a table. Martha's doing like she's always doing, cooking. And Mary's sitting there like she's always doing, at his feet, listening to everything he's got to say. So they're at an eating table. They're eating and they're fellowshipping. Lazarus is sitting on the other side and Jesus is sitting on this side. Read it in John 12, 3. Some might say miracles are at the table. Lazarus represents the miracles. And Jesus at the table. Some might say the table is the place of fellowship. 
Now, a lot of families don't even gather around the table no more. They gather around the TV or, or the phone. Come on, somebody. But the table back in the day weren't just a place where you ate. It was the place of fellowship. It was the place of communion. It's a place where a man and his wife, they go out to eat, and it ain't about just eating. It's about the fellowship. Amen? It's about the communion, the relationship. So everybody say the table represents relationship. Oh, glory to God. It represents communion. And I say that right in front of a communion table. Come on, anybody hear the Holy Ghost? So it's about fellowship and, and it's about relationship. Somebody say it's a private table. Somebody say it's a table where captains come to sit down and make battle plans. They, they acknowledge there's a fight going on. And somebody say it's a private table where they come and sit down with the king and they talk with him because that is the battle plan. When God calls you to a table, he's calling you to a fight. When he says, I've prepared a table before you, meaning I've got a future in my kingdom. I got a work for you to do. I got a calling for you. I'm going to use you to do mighty things to win others to me. So come to the table. I've prepared it for you. And you know I'm getting you ready for a table because I'm taking you through valley after valley so I can get you to appreciate the table. And somebody say, you got to have the king's table. You got to have this private time with him every day. Somebody say, every day you got to come to the table and taste the Lord and see that he is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him, Psalms 34 and 8. Because he is the food I eat. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. So Lazarus is sitting at the table with Jesus. Lazarus represents those who are raised from the dead. Ephesians 2 and 1 says to us who have believed on Jesus, he has quickened us who are dead in our trespasses and sins. He's raised us to newness of life. Romans 6 verses 4. Somebody say we're Lazaruses. We're twice born. We've been raised from the dead. Oh glory to God. And the place the risen from the dead are supposed to go are to the table with him. Somebody shout come and dine. That's Matthew 21 and 12 because that's the only place you can be ready to win any battle. Prepared win any battle that comes. Somebody says before me. But notice this table. He said, I do it in the presence of the enemies. Mm. Now he's done acknowledge God's presence from verses one all the way through verse four and right on into verses five. There's two thou's there. There's only one mention of the presence of the enemy. So that means God's got the presence of the enemy surrounded the whole time. That means the enemy's presence is working for God. Whether they want to acknowledge it or not, he's got a hold of them on both ends. They're coming in and they're going out. They're entering and they're exiting. <laughs> he said, thou preparest, and right there, thou anointest my head. Where does God anoint my head? Somebody say in the presence of my enemies. Uh, remember what Jesus said? Jesus said in uh, Luke 22, 21, and it's the picture of this. It's the, people call it the Lord's Supper, but it was the Passover. Right before Jesus was betrayed and crucified. In Luke 21 and 22, he said, the hand of my betrayer is now with me on the table. Whew. Someone say Jesus was sitting with his disciples and his enemy at the same table. Mm. In Mark 14 through uh, 18 through 20 of Mark 14, Jesus was telling them, one of you is going to betray me tonight. They started talking to him, who is it, Lord? And asked him who. He said, the one that's about to dip their hand in the dish with me. I can picture in the theater of my mind Judas Iscariot dipping the bread in the cup at the same time Jesus was. Remember what Jesus said about the cup in Luke 22? Verses 42, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Amen. 
You remember when they come to seize Jesus, when Jesus, you know, kissed Jesus on the cheek and they, they grabbed hold of him to take him. And, you know, Peter pulled out his sword and cut off Malachus's ear. Amen. And Jesus stopped him in John chapter 18, verse 11. He said, put that sword away. Put it back in your sheath. He said, shall not I drink this cup that my father has willed? Somebody say, don't forget about the cup. Mm hmm Listen right here. He said, thou knowest my head with oil. In Matthew 26, verse 50, Judas is coming to betray Jesus with a kiss with 30 pieces of silver, equivalent to, listen to this. This is how much this was worth in that day. $197.40, what it would have been amounted to today. 30 pieces of silver. Just under 200 bucks, he betrayed Jesus. And in Matthew 26, 50, Jesus said, friend, wherefore art thou come? And then it says they came and they took Jesus. They grabbed hold of him. Boy, when you can call your enemies friends. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, can't nobody get you more anointed than enemies. When God wants to use you, he ain't going to put you in the room of celebrators. That's the last thing you need. That'll give you the big head. That won't get your head anointed. That'll just get you the big head. When God really wants to use you, he's going to put you often in the room of tolerators, irritators. Come on, somebody. People can't stand you. Look at somebody beside you and say, that's not us now. Look at your neighbor and say, I love you. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, I've saw so many forfeit their faith. I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me two days ago. Oh, glory. And I heard him. Whew. He said, hold on a little while longer, my son. He said, because you're just before some of the biggest blessings and miracles you've ever witnessed me perform. He said, that's why it's been so hard. He said, that's why the last few years has been one attack after another. I mean, I've had the demon possessed sit here two years ago before I cast the devil out of him. And the demons was telling him, go shoot the preacher and kill him. And his gun was laying on the pew right there on the fourth row or on the chair. And he couldn't find it. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? And that's just, that's a little light thing. If I just, it, it take me three or four services to tell you everything. That my eyes have seen and my ears have heard. And it's ripped my heart in pieces. Come on, somebody. But somebody shout, you're still at the table when all this is going on. I watch so many people, Sister Melissa, get up from the table when that's happening. Because they think the only ones that's supposed to be at the table is those that like me. Those that celebrate me. But somebody say, don't get up and run from the table when the enemy sits down. Somebody say, if the enemy has sat down at your table, it's because the Lord is about to anoint your head with all that you've never had. And you know what a lot of people do? They get up and they run from that table. Somebody say, that's where God's going to anoint you at. Because God says, if I can trust you to walk with me when you're forsook, when you're betrayed, when you're lied about, when you're railed on, when you're misunderstood and misrepresented it, and you can still do what I tell you to do and you can still sit at the table. Oh, glory to God. Mm, when you study Joseph's life, he was betrayed by his own. Jesus came to his own and they received him not. John 1 11, but verses 12 said, but as many as received him, gave he them the power to become the children of God as many as believed on his name. Jesus was betrayed by his own and that's why we the Gentiles, amen, could hear the gospel and believe and become his own as well and be grafted in all through the the grace of God. Somebody shout good things always come out of bad things. And when God wants to do great things, he allows horrible things to happen first. Oh, glory to God. Because he can't anoint your head if it's the big head. Somebody say enemies help us keep our head the right size. <laughs> <laughs> oh, glory to God. The word enemies here in Hebrew means adversary. We know that ain't nothing but Satan. It also means to afflict, to bind, distress. 
Somebody say, I'm in the right place. In God's presence. At the right table. Uh, humorously, I could hear the, you know, you walk in a restaurant, say, would you like a table or a booth? I always tell them I'm a booth, so I want a table. <laughs> Amen. Somebody say, whatever you do, don't change tables. Stay at the table. Stay at the table because it's the Lord's table. Anybody hear the whole? Well, Brother Marvin, there's enemies there. There's battles. There's all kind of bad stuff going on, but it's the Lord's table. Don't get up from the table. Somebody shout it. Don't get up from the table because that's where God's about to know it yet. Enemies also means a narrower. One who makes things narrow. Who cramps. Literally, the word enemies there means to cramp. To make narrow. It means to shut up, to vex or to trouble. Boy, ain't just like the enemy. He's an adversary. He wants us to shut up, wants us to shut down, wants us to sit back. Amen. A couple months ago when, you know, YouTube, amen, uh, terminated our church from YouTube because I preached on homosexuality and, and preached against abortion. They said it was other things, but I got the proof. I, I screenshotted, hey man, what it was really about. Hey man, and they took us off and we're permanently, our church is permanently off. We can't be back on YouTube unless somebody else buys it like they did Twitter. Hallelujah, praise God, hey amen. And so, uh, you know, and I had people, hundreds of people coming on. And Brother Marvin, don't quit, don't quit. I was thinking, people, I started in 1991. They weren't no internet. They weren't no web services. I, come on somebody they were no Facebooks and Twitters and and socialist media amen and communist YouTube and all these other things hallelujah they weren't none of those things what you mean don't quit hallelujah they didn't give me the platform to begin with anybody hear the Holy Ghost hallelujah but that's what the enemy wants the church to do that's what the enemy amen wants the saints to do that's what the enemy wants the preacher of this gospel to do is shut up one of the definitions of enemy right here in Psalms 23 and 5 and he Hebrew literally means to shut up an enemy that comes to silence and try to get you to hold your peace. But Isaiah 58 verses 1 says, cry loud and spare not. Somebody say it with me, cry loud and spare not. I'll shut up when he calls me from this body. And then I'll still be heard on social media. That's one thing about your enemies. They can get away from you, but they can't get away from what they heard come out your mouth from God. I call it the holy haunting. I can, I can see some of it. I can't get away from it. I, they're trying to sleep and they have dreams and I'm preaching. Oh, I hate him. I will not be around here. Somebody shout, they've left me, but they can't leave. Hey Amen. The Holy Ghost that spoke through me. I had a man come to a service one night and get saved years ago. He said, I keep having dreams and I can't see you, but I hear you preaching. He said, I've been under conviction and I ain't even been to a service until now. He said, but I've come to get saved. He said, because I'm about tired of you preaching to me in my sleep. <laughs> oh, that literally happened. I'm serious. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, in the presence of me, you anoint my head. The word anoint is an approval. It means to accept. That's the anointing of God. But it means to make fat. Fat would mean Blessed. Somebody say, he anoints my head with oil. Now the head, you know, God's got our heart. If you're his, the Lord's your shepherd, he's got your heart. But this is where he gets our head in the valley. That's where he gets our head. That's where he gets our mind. Gets it, gets, gets it on track with what he wants. He changes. Somebody shout, God wants to give you a new head. He wants you to have a single mind, not a double one. Because a double mind of man's in a stable and all his ways, James 1 and 8. Where does God make strong men of God and strong women of God? Somebody see in a valley. Somebody see in a table where enemies are always sitting. You ever just felt like they, it didn't matter what you did? Sometimes I feel like that. The more God uses me and the more my mouth opens, I say, Lord, I, it, it don't matter what I say. Used to, I used to just get almost depressed over it. And the Holy Ghost said, you need to start rejoicing. Hello? Because the more enemies means the bigger of how I'm going to use you. 
Somebody say, there's a great and effectual door open unto me. Great and effectual door open unto me. And there are many adversaries, 1 Corinthians 16 and 9. Somebody say, the door may be greater. It may be more effective. But somebody say, there's always bigger enemies. Mm -hmm. God told little David, through Samuel the prophet, you're going to be the next king. And he poured oil on him. David didn't go to the throne. Saul pursued him, tried to kill him. He ran into Goliath. He ran from his own son, had to camp out in caves for years. Somebody say there's a process to the palace. Joseph had to be lied on, betrayed. Come on, somebody, falsely accused, be in prison for two years before God trust him with that level of glory. But everybody say with me, when the enemy's presence gets bigger, that's a sign that what God's got on you is bigger than you know. Somebody say, I was already anointed. He anointed me for it. He didn't anoint me for easy. He anointed me for this warfare. Somebody say, I was anointed. God anointed David from that day forward, 1 Samuel 16 and 13. Somebody say, I was anointed for this valley. I was anointed to go through this. I was anointed to win this battle. I was anointed to overcome this. I was anointed to move this mountain. I was anointed to see what God said I would see. But somebody say, I got to stay at the table when the enemies show up. Now, ain't it amazing? At this table that God prepares him for. He don't say nothing about the presence of friends. Where have they at? Somebody say right before God's going to use you. You're going to find these people going to turn away from you. These people are going to betray you. There's things going to happen. It's going to rip your heart to pieces. The apostles went through it. Our Savior went through it. All the prophets of the old covenant, everybody goes through this process. Because this is where God anoints our head. Somebody say, without it, our head would get too big and God wouldn't be able to use us. This is where he gets our head. He's got our heart, but this is where he gets our head. He anoints our head. Amen. He, he blesses us. Somebody say, the oil's running down. This is the, the gifting of God. It's on our life. <laughs> Hallelujah. That word, anoint the head, literally also means to take away the ashes. Amen. That's what the priests would do. They would come into the tabernacle and they'd have to remove the ashes Amen. Uh, even from the lamps. Uh, so the oil and the wick, it's called trimming the wick. They would get the old ashes out so the oil and the wick could connect and so the flame could burn. They had to trim it daily. They had to remove all the ash and the soot and clean it out or it would stifle the fire. Somebody say when God wants to get all the burnt ashes out, when he wants to get our past out of us, when he wants to get all that stuff, that dead weight out of us, he takes us in the valleys and he sits us down at his table that he's preparing to use us with and he invites enemies but he's there the whole time he's orchestrating it. somebody say God's table where he's going to anoint me the most enemies are welcome oh Lord Whew. next time somebody hurts your feelings for his name's sake, go shake the hand and say thank you. <coughs> Give him a $20 bill. Say, can I buy you a tank of gas? Not with a $20 bill, but can I bless those that persecute you, bless and curse not? Why? Because they're getting you anointed. Hello, anybody here, the Holy Ghost? All right. He said, my cup runneth over. That means I'm satisfied. But the cup is the gift. And we preach about Jesus on the cross, but I've gave you scriptures earlier where he talked about the cup. Don't let it pass. He said, Lord, let it pass from me. Nevertheless, not your will, but your, but my, not my will, but your will be done. Luke 22, verse 42. So the cup is a gift. It's a place where there's blessings. Jesus told him in Matthew 22 and 26, he said, I'm going to drink of this cup with you anew in heaven with my father one day. It's the cup he lifted up and blessed in Matthew 22 and said, this is my blood. Drink it, it's for the remission of your sins. 
It weren't blood, it was the juice, but still it was the fruit of the vine. The cup. The cup represents sometimes the judgment and the wrath and the hard play. It represents the cross. The cup. Somebody say right between the presence of my enemies and the cup running over. Mm -hmm. The cross I'm having to bear. There comes an anointing right in the middle of it all. Somebody ought to give God praise for the cup that runs over. Because that's where your gift is going to run over. When you're bearing the cross. When you're in the valley. When folks has turned on you. And people's betraying you. And things ain't working out like you want them to work out. Somebody shot you still at his table. When God told me to plant this church. Five. A little over five years ago. On Carswell Avenue. June 25th. 2017. In a little upper room above Ameris Bank. When Ameris Bank was there. At Carswell Avenue. For three months, we were there. Then for 12 months, we were on Plant Avenue up here in a leased building of two doctors. Then on November of 2018, God supernaturally blessed us with this place to purchase. I'm talking about one supernatural event after another. Witches in North Carolina was attacking my ministry. I was getting threats, but the police was involved because I was literally getting daily threats. Um, and then in 2019, I had a whole group of Satanists nationwide come against me in my ministry, threatening me, spreading all kind of crazy stuff, weird stuff. Amen. Hallelujah. And then Jezebel in 2020 rose up right in the midst. I'm talking about that principality of religious witchcraft to try to sabotage and kill the prophet and kill what God and stop what God wants to do right from within the house and that manifested in, in probably a two year space of time anybody here Holy Ghost but can I tell you what God told me in the spring of 2017 he said the name Acts 29 that you preached in Central Florida when you told people in that revival years ago in 2012 you told them to open their Bible to Acts 29 and everybody including the pastor tried to find it and then they stopped and looked at you like you'd lost your mind and I told them you're Acts 29 because there's only 28 chapters but the last verse is up there and the last part of that verse ends with no man forbidding him the book of Acts has not stopped the Holy Ghost it's his Acts not the Apostles it didn't stop with them because it weren't theirs. It's his, and he's the eternal spirit, Hebrews 9, 14. God said, I want you to build me a church on that foundation that I'm still the same Holy Ghost, and I still got acts. They've not stopped. All right? Two, for Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, when he poured out his spirit and birthed his church. 1 Corinthians 12, there's nine mentions of the Holy Spirit, and there's nine mentions of his gifts. Nine mentions of the Holy Ghost and nine mentions of the gifts of the Spirit. Two nine. Then Church unto God from Acts 12 and 5. That same revival in Central Florida in 2012, I preached a message entitled Church unto God. Because in Acts 12 and 5, Peter was in prison. Just before the Passover, Herod was going to kill him. The church prayed. The church unto God. Somebody say they prayed without ceasing. That's not some little copycat cliche off of a denomination. Has nothing to do with it. It's from scripture. Church unto God just means a praying church. God said, I want an Acts 29 church. I want one that's founded on the book of Acts 2, founded on 1 Corinthians 12, nine gifts of my spirit. 29 meaning the continuation where Pentecost continues. Hey Amen. I've not stopped being the Holy Ghost. These are the acts of mine, not the acts of men. Hallelujah. Amen. And he said, I want it to be a praying church. One that prays unto me. Come on, don't just go have services, but actually praise and seeks me. I've had enough of groups in and out and through here to fill up five of these. Anybody here, Holy Ghost? My aunt was raised from the dead. She sits right here in 2018 on Plant Avenue on the sidewalk I've watched demons come out of people right here in these altars this lady in January 2019 had a 
some type of lump in her side, visible, you could feel it. And it went away right over there. Ain't been back, has it? Hallelujah. And that's just a few things. I've watched people come down and get saved. I saw this man. I don't know how many months, 15 maybe, almost two years ago. Come here after his wife and family come here and his kids and watch his kids testify and him go weeping like a baby. And then on a homecoming, hallelujah, come down to the altar and get saved. He's one of the most faithfulest men in the church. Hallelujah, him and his family. And Sister Angie put their names in the prayer box way back. Hello? Hallelujah. And that's just a few of the things, but they're important to make mention. But here's why I said all that. This is that. In spring of 2017, the Holy Ghost told me, he said, call it Acts 29, Church unto God. And he said, go, go and plant in the presence of your enemies. I said, do what, Lord? And the Lord spoke to me. He said, a prophet's not without honor except in his own hometown. I said, Lord, I was born in Waycross. He said, that's where I want you to plant it. I said, Lord, I've probably preached on more streets, sidewalks, parks. I used to do street meetings where the big Walmart is. There weren't nothing out there but a big field. Hello? They ain't hardly nowhere in the city I ain't preached at on the streets or in the fields. I said, Lord, Waycross. At the time, I, you know, I just had doors open in Waycross. I'd preach long revivals, and I hadn't preached in Waycross in a while. I said, Lord, I got more family that lives in Ware County. They could fill up five or six churches. I said, Lord, Waycross? He said, yeah, this is where I'm going to prepare the table at. Go plant it. I said, Lord, everybody around Waycross don't like me. I literally told the Lord that. I had people with us at the time. God told us to go with you. God told us. They lasted almost three years. Hello? I've had many more since then said God said. Some last three months, some lasted three days. But I said all that to say this. This is still God's table. Anybody here Holy Ghost? And I will not get up from the table though there's been a lot that's got up from the table. Have you ever been tempted to get up from the table? Oh, yes. A many time I've been tempted to get up from the table. Hallelujah. But I'm telling you by the Spirit of God, he told me this scripture before I started doing anything. He said, this is a battle table. This ain't just a table to eat at. You're going to fight one more warfare like you ain't never in your life seen. Son, I've seen more witches, more Satanists, more demon possessed. I've seen more crazy stuff in the last five years out of humankind than I have in all my ministry. It's the strangest, weirdest thing. I've had people turn on me I thought would never turn on me. I've had stuff done to me and said about me I thought would never. I'm talking about close folk. I'm talking about kin. I'm talking about some of the craziest, strangest things you've ever seen in your life that would manifest even against my body physically. Amen. At the warfare. But I'm here to tell you on December the 1st, 2022, it's still God's table. And God told me two days ago, he said, son, whatever you do, don't leave the table. He said, hold on just a little while longer, son, because you're about to see some of the greatest and the biggest acts of mine you have never witnessed in all your life. No wonder he gave me a trophy tonight. Brother Austin gave me a trophy because for every trial... 
there's a trophy coming. I prophesy graduation day is coming. Woo! And you can't graduate without a test, without a trial. Well, somebody stand up on your feet tonight and shout, thank God, for the presence of enemies. Because that's where he's going to anoint my head with oil. That's where he's preparing the table before me. And it don't close there. Listen to what he said in verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Listen to what he said he's going to do. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you follow the shepherd, you'll dwell in his house too. If you follow this shepherd, he won't just lead you by still waters and in the green pastures. And he won't just lead you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's going to lead you through valleys. Uh, he's going to lead you into places where he prepares a table. And it's going to be one battle after another. And enemies are going to be all around you. And folks that said they were with you are going to turn against you. And you gonna, can't find nobody but him. You'll see he's with you. Uh, glory to God. And you'll appreciate him. Amen. More than you ever have in those moments. And somebody shout, but in those times, God says something's hunting you down. It's goodness and mercy will follow you if you'll follow me through these times of testing. Follow the shepherd through these times of testing and stay at his table. God says you'll dwell in my house. Somebody shout, the shepherd didn't call you to follow him to forsake his house. There's a lot of people deceived. They think they're following the shepherd. But I'm not talking about me. They think they're following Jesus, the great shepherd. But they do not dwell in his house. They are deceived. Lord, I declare tonight I'm a house dweller. If anybody leaves, it'll be Jezebel. If anybody leaves, it'll be the devil. And I declare tonight, goodness and mercy is going to follow us. Behold, I say this night, lift up your heart with your hands unto me who dwells in the heavens and make your stand of faith and stand still and see my salvation with you. For this battle is not yours, but it is mine. And I've already assured you of victory, but you must not forfeit your faith in this moment. Because everything around you looks the opposite of what I told you it would be. But it always looks like that right before it becomes a reality. So stand, my little ones, even if you have to stand with me on your own and by yourself. For behold, I'm not a man that I should lie. I'm not the son of man that I should repent. If I said it, I'll do it. If I speak it, I'll make it good, says the Lord. Come on, lift up your voice and praise him tonight. I want to lay hands on people and pray for people right now. You feel like you in a cave. The enemy has used people even around you that David described in Psalms 55 as his own brethren. Your heart's been broke. It's been ripped. You've been tormented. You may have even been lied on. And you feel like you're just in a desert right by yourself. But I declare over you tonight, you may be in a desert, but you ain't deserted. I want to lay hands on people like that. Because God says, I'm about to anoint you with the oil that I told you I would anoint you with. Somebody say, get your focus back on the oil. Get your focus back on the anointer. I know the presence of the enemies have been many, but somebody shout, even when the enemy is called many, you still serve a God named El Shaddai, who's more than enough. Salvatore, I bad. This is how we fight up in battles. 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 You may look 
like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. We don't run. We stand. We stay. Yeah. This is how we fight our battles. 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 It look like I'm surrounded, surrounded by you, hallelujah. Holy in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. This is how we find our battles. Like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Touch your law. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Woo! It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how it's fine. In John 18, Judas Iscariot and everyone came in the garden to seize Jesus. And they said, are you him? He said, I am he in verse 6. And they all fell backward on the ground. <laughs> yes, in the name of Jesus. Stick in there. To stand and see my salvation, says the Lord. Ooh, hallelujah. My God, touch him, Holy Ghost. Give him strength to stand. It may look like I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Whoa, it may look, whoa, you ain't alone. I would fight our battle. This is how we fight our battle. Ooh, hallelujah, Lord. In the name of Jesus. This is how we fight our battles. How, Brother Marvin, we just stand. Having our loins girt about with truth. Ephesians 6, 14. Somebody say stand. Stand. Somebody say don't run. Ooh, how many of y'all running? In or out? <laughs> we ain't running nobody. But we are running after one body. Draw me and we will run after thee. Song of Solomon 1, 4. Psalms 18. 29, by thee have I run through a troop, and by my God shall I leap over a wall. Ooh, this is how I find my bed. The Lord says, daughter, they tried to help you, but I'm your healer. Whew, my God. Touch my mama, Lord, yes, hallelujah. This is how we find our battles. You feeling better? Come on. Lift your hands. Oh, Lord, touch Sister Melissa. This is how we find our battles. Breathe, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Hebrews 11 and 2 
somebody and say, pass the test with an F. With faith in God. Hallelujah. This is how we find battle. We don't fight running away. No. By you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Ooh. Hallelujah. Touching us, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Holy. You're worthy. I'll call upon the Lord who's worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Psalms 18 and 3. Hey, Brother Tyler, you remember a couple years ago, almost this time, it would have been January. Jezebel attacked me through somebody and my body was all twisted. I couldn't even walk. Remember you was at my right arm. He was laying hands on me, praying for me in the house and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. Lift your hands. God said, I'm about to stir up my gifts in you. Mm, I don't know how much you pray in the spirit, but God said it's about to be a whole lot more. This test will be a testimony. Holy Lord, stir up every gift in him. Give him strength. Give him power to release and to move and to walk on and to let go of and go forward in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Ooh. Holy, holy. At the table. Somebody say, stay at the table. Mm, somebody say he's able at the table. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Holy, holy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Mighty Lord, we'll glorify. The statement in Psalms 23 and 5 that says, Thou prepare us a table. Prepare us a table. Prepare us and the table part together. All of, it literally means to set in array, remember, a table of battle where battle plans are made, a king's table, a private table. That's a table where me and you get along with God daily. That, that's, that's where the battles won it. Huh? But that prepare us a table also in Hebrew literally means to not only set an array and to set in order, but it means to ordain, to set apart. Somebody say in the presence of enemies, in valleys, God sets a table and he ordains it all for that moment where he anoints our head with oil. Somebody to say the enemies have been ordained. Not just the friends, but the enemies. Why? Because that word ordained means to set apart. When God wants to set you apart, sometimes he makes you feel like you're being pulled apart. But he sets you apart because God never anoints you to blend in. He only anoints you to stick out. 
Come on, anybody hear Holy Ghost? Somebody say God ordains the enemies. Somebody say every wrong person, every wrong person was ordained. Jesus kind of did what he did without Judas. No wonder said Jesus in Matthew 5, 10, 11. Blessed are you when men shall persecute you for my name's sake and speak all manner of evil against you. Great is your reward in heaven. Hallelujah. I ain't lying. Y'all may think that was just a kid doing something, but when little Austin gave that to me tonight, it was like the Lord's telling me, they, I, I could hear it, there's a trophy coming for every trial. Dylan, he's in Wisconsin, you know, but he had a dream right before Thanksgiving, kind of similar to that, amen, in reference to me. And uh, God spoke to him. And, Hallelujah, glory to God. Somebody say the valley was ordained. Somebody say the wilderness has been ordained. My God. Somebody say that table he prepared was in the valley. It was there where the presence of enemies were at. All of it's been ordained for his glory. Mm. The betrayal was ordained. The battle was ordained. Well, it makes me feel better. If God ordained it all, that means he's got it all in his control. That means he says when it can come and when it has to go. It's in all in his hands. Psalms 31, 15 said, My times are in your hand. Deliver me from those who persecute me from the hand of my enemies. David right there acknowledged God my time. Somebody say all of them. Even when I'm in the presence of enemies and there's warfare like I've never seen. A little tipsy there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little tipsy from being at the table. Uh, her cup runneth over. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. May need a designated driver. Praise God. Be ye not drunk with wine, where does it says, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18. Lord, we give you praise and we thank you tonight. Thank you for what a word is this. Somebody say, the prepared table.